see your comments on my phone here. Um, so cool. All right, we're good. So one uh, quick note here as we're getting ready to get started, there's 700 people registered for this. Obviously, I can't answer 700,000 questions from you guys, but I'm going to do my best. We're going to get an hour here. So what I'm going to do, um, the, I got a, a lot of great feedback from the Q&A from the uh, survey, and there were two things that were really consistent. Now, there were tons of great suggestions. I wish that I can't get to them all right now, but if, uh, if you guys like this format, we'll keep doing these. So um, the two things that were the most common were the transition, which everybody struggles with, and how to keep your swing really working during the winter. And those are two things that rotary swing is really, really uh, at the top of the heap for that we do really, really well. And so those are two things that uh, I, I want to make sure that oh, it says pick froze. That could be, uh, I'm going to try and not interrupt myself a whole bunch here, but if you guys start getting a bunch of technical issues, it's probably a Wi-Fi issue on your end. Um, but if I'll try to catch them here as I can on my phone. But uh, Anyway, all right, so here's the two things that I want to talk about is dealing with the transition and with the uh, how to kind of keep your swing lubed up during the winter. We'll try to cover both. And again, like I said, I'll keep trying to uh, keep trying to check everything here as I go back. So, all right, hands down, number one thing that every single amateur just destroys their golf swing with is the transition, okay? And just for those of you that don't know and aren't as technically swing-minded as others, the transition is the, the change of direction from when the, your body and the club is going backwards to getting ready to come back down to strike the ball. And that's what we call the transition. That transition, I'm just like a little message here. Oh, okay. Uh, the transition is my swing like my normal. We'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, the transition is what makes everything work in the swing. When I say everything, I literally mean every critical component, which is having lag, leverage in the swing, the angle between your forearm and the shaft, club head speed, tension, swing plane, swing path. All of that stuff is radically changed when, what, depending on how you transition, good or bad. So the, the key is understanding what causes you to have a really poor transition and then understanding how to fix it. And that's honestly, it's really, really simple, but I'm gonna go into it a little bit more in depth because I, so many people struggle with it and I got so many questions about it. So the number one thing that you do, and I'm gonna ask this question, I'll give you guys a chance to answer it first. What is the first thing that starts the transition? So if you guys can pop it up in your chat here, I'm gonna look for answers, see what we got. The first thing that you do to start your transition, what is it? Somebody answer for me. Anybody, Bueller, come on, so the weight shift, there we go, thank you, Chan. If I had a, a prize, I'd give it to you. The weight shift is what lets everything sequence, and the golf swing at the end of the day is all about sequencing. And so if you sequence correctly, everything starts to fall into place. When you don't sequence correctly, then everything falls apart. Now, with the transition, here is the number one thing that everybody does from the top is when they go from here, they start unwinding their shoulders, either from pushing from this right leg, we see the right heel come up in the air right away, this is what causes you to lose your posture, or they start pushing from the right side of the body. And all of these things cause every single swing flaw that you ever have struggled with. And I mean everything. If you start pushing from the right side, look how steep the shaft is. Look how it comes out over, starts getting near vertical, and goes past my right shoulder. Notice as I start pushing from the right side, that I start losing my posture, losing my spine angle. I start moving my hips into the ball. I call this the puppy dog humping the fire hydrant. You don't want this move here. All of these things, swinging over the top, it's all caused from tension in the wrong place at the right, wrong time. And typically, that's coming from your shoulders, your upper body, and typically your right shoulder, right arm. People have, just can't believe how relaxed relatively this side of your body needs to be at the top of your backswing in order for the swing to sequence correctly. It doesn't matter how hard you try or what you tell yourself or how good your intentions are, if you have a lot of tension built up here in the right side of your body, whether it be in your right leg, your right hip, or the right shoulder, 
it will fire first, and it'll cause all the bad things I just talked about. You'll throw the club away, you'll lose lag, you'll swing over the top, you'll swing across the ball, etc. All of that stuff is caused by tension. So the first thing that you've got to figure out is getting rid of this tension. So what I want you to do, and if you're standing there in front of your computer, I want you to get up and do this with me. I want you to go to this, get in your setup, put your arms across your chest, and I want you to think about the, the move we've talked about, I've talked about a million times, taking that right shoulder, pulling it behind your head, and just make a nice little turn. And I want you to tell me what you feel in the right side of your body right now, your right arm, your right tricep, your right shoulder. You probably don't feel anything, right? Because you didn't use that to do anything. You focus instead, if you've been watching the videos, using your torso to turn your body and your arms and shoulders stay really relaxed. This is what it should feel like at the top of your swing. That should be an aha moment for you. That's how little tension you should have in the right arm, right side of your body, right shoulder at the top of your swing. Now the difference is, of course, when we grab a club, we want to start picking this thing up and swinging it around and force it to go where we want it to, when in reality what you need to do is move the club with your body like you just did. The whole backswing is no more complicated than what I just showed you here. If you can do this, you can swing like every great tour player on the planet. It's that simple. The problem comes when we start worrying about this little thing and start doing this and moving around all over the place. So if you focus on this, when you go to the top, you still want to feel that that right arm, that right shoulder has the same level of tension. Now, of course, there'll be a little bit more tension than you know, when you're not moving it at all, because of course, some muscular efforts involved in helping the club swing up, but really what you want to try and use is momentum created by your body rotation to help swing the club up for you. You don't want to take the club and try and pick it up. If you have tension in your forearms and your grip and your shoulders, when you're setting up to the ball, that's a huge sign that your brain is getting ready to use those muscles way too early in the swing. And that's the problem. Instead of trying to use your body to move the club, to start it back and feel like you're just turning your body, we all want to do this and pick the club and get ready to slaughter that ball right away. So tension is the number one thing to circle back, long story here, to circle back to why you can't transition properly. Because if these muscles are loaded first, right from a dress, right from the takeaway, and at the top of your swing, you're ready to tomahawk it, you'll never transition correctly. And so many golfers struggle with weight shift, they don't understand why, I'm giving you the answer. And hint, this is it. If you have tension here, you'll never be able to shift your weight properly first. And if you do, you try to shift properly, but this is so tight and so ready to fire that what you'll have to do in order to shift your hips fast enough to outrun how quick your arms can move, you'll have to push really hard off the right leg. And as soon as you do that, you lose your posture and everything else goes in the trash bucket. So, in order to have a proper transition and be able to shift your weight correctly, it all comes down to tension. We're doing, no gotta have some tension, right? So where we do want tension is in our lower body. So when we go to the top, instead of winding this up and feeling so tight that you can't move at all, but just needs to unwind, I wanna feel that my lower body, and specifically my left side, my left leg, is the first thing that's ready to move, and so it's gotta have a little tension in this left hip area so that it can move first. You put that together and you start getting tension in the right places, that is how you start transitioning correctly. That's how you shift your weight correctly. So if you struggle with your weight shift, I guarantee you, you have too much tension in your arms, your shoulders, the right side of your body, etc. And all of that stuff has got to relax. And that is what allows you to make a proper transition. So now I'm going to check in and see you make sure everything's doing okay. Uh, everything's frozen. Oh, okay. It's like everybody's okay here for the most part. Some people with some internet connection issues. But, so if you have any questions now, there's a questions and answers tab. Um, if you have some questions on the transition now, I want to cover them now. So please post them in the questions and answers tab there, and I'll do my best to answer everything I can. How about swing thoughts to support this idea? Swing thoughts to me are a double-edged sword. I'm not a huge fan of swing thoughts, but I'll do my best to answer that question. Your brain needs to be generally in your swing, in your trunk, in your lower body. And so if you're focusing on moving this, your lower body, or your, excuse me, your upper body 
will have to follow along because it's attached to your pelvis via your spine and, of course, all this connective tissue. So if your brain is always focused down here, this stuff will have a chance to work out right. The problem is that we all focus on this stuff up here, and so that's what tends to fire first, and then we don't ever think about our lower body, so how would we ever get a chance to move it correctly first? So to answer your question as far as the swing thought, there's not one specific swing thought. Swing thoughts are very subjective. Everybody, there's no real rhyme or reasons per se to have some effective swing thought. And to be honest with you, swing thoughts I, I call chopping wood, and W-O-O-D. Swing thoughts are things that work only one day. And the reason is you're just constantly chasing after yourself. So really what you want to do is work on feeling what it is you're trying to do that you're struggling with. So if you're struggling with your weight shift, then the number one thing I would be trying to focus on and feel is develop a sense of this being, my upper body being relaxed, while this is being ready to focus and move first. You'll notice I try to move my left knee just a little bit first to get that first move to help move my pelvis back over to the left. So as far as the swing thought, you could take something from that. You could say, well, I want to move my left knee first. It doesn't move a lot. It just moves into neutral joint alignment back over my left ankle. But if you wanted to think of that, you'll notice that as I'm doing this, my hips are starting to unwind and shift back to the left, but my shoulders are still staying relatively shut. So that might be a good swing thought for you. What else we got in here? Uh, David, does hand position at the top affect swing path during the transition? And how important would hand position be? It absolutely does. But, again, this is where people tend to focus on the wrong thing. So, David, it's a great question because it's a really common thing that people misunderstand. And I'm going to give you an example of this, of why this is, while it's incredibly important, it's less important than everybody tends to make you believe. And what I mean by that is, if you look at Jim Furyk at the top, where are his arms, right? Way up here somewhere. Now, he doesn't swing down from there like every amateur typically would, because if they did, they'd swing over the top and whack across the ball and slice it. So what does he do? From here, he obviously shallows it out with a really big leg drive and really relaxed arms to allow his arms to come back to the inside and with his club. He actually creates a perfectly square path at impact. Now, obviously, that's a really complex movement pattern, which is what all the golf swing is. It's just a movement pattern. So while it still creates a good swing path at the end of the day, it's pretty complex to try and teach somebody to do that. So now by the same token, you can swing really flat and still heave over the top or come over. It all depends on how you sequence your body. Remember I said everything comes down to sequencing, and it's where you move from that's going to dictate what kind of golfer you are. So your hands could be really low, they could be really high, and you could still figure out some sort of compensation to make it all work together. In an ideal world, RST is all about having the fewest moving parts literally humanly possible. That's why we looked at it from an anatomical perspective. We actually look at the joints, the body, the bones, and putting the arms in a position to where if we just did nothing else but shift our weight, my club drops right down on plane without me having to do this big loop or any of those things. So the backswing position that we teach in the, the five minutes to the perfect backswing video is why that arm position is where it is, why the hand position is where it is. So if you look at the five minutes to the perfect back swing video, it's specifically teaching you from a standing position exactly what I'm doing. This is the drill in the video, without going in depth about it, of exactly where your hands need to be so you don't have to have any compensations like that. So hopefully that answers your question. Jack, we're backing into the target with center of the lower back stop over the top at the shoulders. I'm not sure I followed that on Jack. If you could rephrase the question, I would appreciate it. Uh, Dennis, how do I start the transition without, while still turning back? Great question. Again, it comes down to tension is how you're going to sequence your swing correctly. It will sequence correctly if you create tension in the right place at the right time. This is your brain's number one cue for how to start the downswing and start moving the other direction is tension, muscular tension. Think about this for a second. You don't have to understand a golf swing at the level that I do to understand how to fix your swing. If you load a muscle and you get really, really tight and you contract as hard as you can, what is the number one thing your brain is telling you to do? It wants you to release that tension. Your golf swing, of course, is exactly the same. It's just happening much quicker, but it's the same dynamics. So if you've got a ton of tension as you're going back and you're trying to start back the other way, you need to load the muscles that you want to be moving first and the muscles that you don't want to be moving 
need to be relaxed. So in other words, the reason people don't kind of get that little sequence of the upper body and the club is still going back and then the lower body is starting to unwind a little bit before the upper body finishes its turn is because this is really, really tight and it fires first. So again, it comes down to loading your muscles and creating tension in the right place at the right time. Uh, any other questions here? So I see some questions in the chat session section and some in the Q&A section. So I'll try to go through both. Uh, how to stop taming the club on the inside. Taking the club, I'm assuming, on the inside and stop rolling the wrists. Uh, I'm going to try and keep all of this stuff into the downswing transition stuff just to make it consistent. Uh, we'll do another webinar soon, and if it's going to be a takeaway one, I'll try and do a bunch of takeaway stuff. But uh, we're going to try and keep this kind of consistent on the same thing. So if you want to have questions, please post them kind of more towards the idea of transition and that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. Let me go back to the bottom of the list here, see what I can find. Uh, what about a squat as a trigger to start the transition? It's a good question. The squat is kind of like a graduate level move. It's incredibly powerful. It's very important, but you don't necessarily have to do it that much in order to get the benefits from it. And so I want to talk about what that squat is for just a second, because this does have to do with the transition, and how and why you should use it. And when you're ready to implement this in your swing, what it's really going to do for you. So the squat move, a lot of people kind of, you know, Sam Steve was kind of famous for this. As he went to the top, he kind of had this bow-legged look as he started his transition down. And people never understood what that was really all about. And it was a brilliant move. Tiger Woods kind of got famous for the same thing, but not so much a bow-legged move, but an actual squat move. The squat move is creating tension. Remember what I said earlier? Everything's about sequencing and tension, sequencing and tension. If you want to be able to use your legs in the downswing at impact in order to generate power and leverage from the ground, you have to activate them. So if I go down into impact, excuse me, if I'm in the downswing and I'm like this, like every typical amateur golfer, I'm just kind of, my leg kind of straight. Well, what can I do with my legs right now? Nothing, right? Because my legs are fully extended. So these, these joints, unless I create an angle here, there's nothing for me to do anything with these muscles because they're already fully extended or in this in case relaxed. So as I go and I start squat down, now what I've done is created potential energy. As if I'm doing this during the transition move, this allows me by the time I'm done creating tension and loading up these muscle fibers in my legs, as I get into the impact position, I'm going to be pushing up. So you'll notice, I'll put face on here, as I start down, I'm kind of doing my little squat move here. Again, this doesn't have to be very exaggerated. It can be a small amount. We're just trying to load muscles, muscle fibers. So as I do this, and I'm in this position now, as I'm getting ready to come into impact, I'm going to start pushing this leg up because I've got an angle here, which is potential energy. As I push against the ground, my body's moving in what direction? It's moving up. What direction is the club supposed to be moving at this point? down, equal and opposites. So as I move my hip up and back, that forces the club to move down and out away from me. That's what I'm talking about when I say yeah, I hit the ball with my legs. That's what we mean by that. So in order for me to have this leverage, this potential energy in my lower body to be able to create this leverage and make the club go down and out while my hips go up and back, always moving in the opposite direction of the clubs, an RST mantra. So as we're trying to get the club to go this way, I want to move my body this way. In order to do that, I have to have this squat element during the transition so that I load muscle fibers so that I can push up against the ground. Does that make sense? Hopefully that answers your question there. I'll try and dive in here and see if there are any more on that. Let's see. Oh, now you guys have tricked me. You move all your questions to the other side. Okay. Uh, let me try to catch back up here. Um, let's see. Try to catch up. There's a lot of questions here, guys. I'm going to do my best, I promise. But, uh, Chan, is shallowing the club a passive move related to weight shift rather than that active move? Absolutely. Your arms and hands are responding to what your lower body is telling them and making them do. So, yes, 100%. Uh, Robert, my right elbow never seems to get out in front of the right side, always behind. 
you're pushing too hard from your right side of your body, plain and simple. If your right elbow is stuck like this at impact, it's because you're pushing from your right leg and your arms are stuck behind your body and they can't catch up. You've got to stop pushing from your right leg. It's a huge part of what we do when we're talking about the RC five-step videos is getting you to move your body in the right sequence and from the correct side of your body. Uh, when do you consider the transition complete? It's hmm. an interesting question. Um, I would say at the end of the squat move would probably be a good thing because I'm now got everything moving back the other direction and the club should have changed directions by then. So once the club direction is changed and not moving the other way, transition is pretty much done. Uh, do you have a tip? Uh, rolling wrist. That's more of a takeaway thing or I'm assuming down to an impact thing. I'm still trying to focus more on transition stuff here. Uh, Brian, okay, so assuming I'm one that is too tense in the shoulders at the top of the back, so do I just try to relax more and tighten the left knee hip more? More or less, yes, that's kind of, that's the big picture answer, right? It's obviously a lot simpler said than done. The key is getting your brain to go through enough exercises, enough repetitions, to where your body is instinctively loading the right muscles first. And that takes a little bit of practice by doing these drills of focusing on turning and feeling resistance and coil and tension in this part of your body while learning to feel that it's okay for this to feel relaxed. And that's a big transition mentally for a lot of golfers is to go to the top of their swing and feel like, oh, my arms really aren't doing anything. If you can, you're not gonna be able to do that at first because you won't know how to hit the ball and generate any power there. And that's gonna unfortunately always override our subconscious is always gonna be like, well, I'm at the top of my swing, I now need to hit the ball really hard, and that will tend to override any good good intentions that you may have to use your lower body first. So it just takes a little bit of practice of going to the top and staying relaxed while having something active to do. If you start learning how to move your lower body first by weight shifting your weight and posting up, and your brain is just focused on nothing but your hip movement and posting up on the left side, by the time you're done putting all your mental energy in thinking about this, the club's already at impact. And you don't have to do anything with your arms. And that's kind of the essence of the swing, is that when you're focusing on moving from this, it takes so much mental energy at first that you won't have time to really think about your arms. So if you put, I always tell people to put their head in their ass. It's a bad way of putting it, but it gives us an excuse for being, uh, you know, men typically. So if you think about your, your, your swing coming happening from here to here, basically, and you think about just what's happening here, and you don't worry about what your arms and hands are doing, and just forget about them. Give up control to gain control for a little bit. As you start coming down, you'll realize by the time you get posted up, look where my hands are, I don't have to worry about my hands. It's just a little mental exercise to get over that first. Uh, how still should you hold your head in transition? Don't worry about it. As long as you're not pushing hard off the right side, your head's not going to move out in front of the ball. So don't worry about your head. It's going to move a little bit. It's natural. Don't sweat it. Uh, okay, so knee starts transition and squat. Yeah, you can think of it like that. The knee, this little knee move, a lot of people get kind of confused about it, but I'm gonna make it really simple for you to understand why that I, I use this as a, as a teaching tool. If you were to throw a ball or a spear or something, a rock, what would be the first thing that you would do? Well, first thing we do is we'd naturally shift our weight all the way to the right side, if you're a right-handed thrower. And then we rotate on this hip, and then we get ready to stride. Guess what the first thing to move would be? You externally rotate your leg while taking a stride to move and orient your pelvis in the direction that you're going to throw this object. It's the most efficient way mankind has figured out how to propel something when we are hunting for food or throwing baseballs. So this movement is the same thing you're doing in the golf swing. The only difference is you just can't take a step. I guess you can technically. We've done that before. It's a good drill to exercise to take a step to get you used to shifting your weight. But the same thing is happening. We're coiled up just like we're throwing a ball, and now we're just moving that knee to help externally rotate to get the weight and the hips rotating and moving in the other direction. So that's a good way of thinking about it. Uh, Chan, I've heard the term closed hip slide. What is that? Is this a good move or a bad move? It's a bad move. A closed hip slide, when we go back 
when we take our movement to the top, your hips are going to turn about 45 degrees, right? So this is square, parallel to the target line. They're now 45 degrees closed to the target. What people tend to do is then push off their right leg in order to shift their weight. Now, how much did my hips rotate? Well, really not much at all. This didn't help me at all because now I haven't turned my hips. My hip rotation is what turns my upper body in the downswing, and that's what moves the club and the arms back to the ball. So when you do this closed hip slide, all you're doing is shifting your weight, which I'll give you an A for effort, that's a good start, but you've also got to be unwinding your hips to get them turned enough to bring your shoulders back to square. So closed hip slide, no going out. Do you pronate your wrist at impact? I find it hard. Uh, yes, but again, I'm going to try to focus more on transition stuff. I see now you guys are tricking me and putting questions both on both sides again. So I'll catch the top one here. Can you clarify posting up on the down center? Are you straightening your lead leg? Yes. You are straightening your lead leg. It is not straight at impact. It is straightening so that you can still deliver force during the strike. So yes, you are definitely straightening your lead leg. One of the biggest mistakes that a lot of golfers make is they come into impact like this. Not only is their knee out past their ankle, which puts it in a very susceptible position for injury, but there's no power in this. This doesn't look like a powerful position. Power is created primarily by leverage in the swing. Leverage is taking an angle and then reducing that angle. So as I'm pushing against the ground, I'm using the ground for force to help move my body up in order to help move the club down. So let's see, let me see if I can scroll back through some of these. Uh, Pat, should I post up before moving my trail foot? Um, if I understand your question correctly, I try to make all my students keep their right foot on the ground if they have a problem with pushing and turning it up really early until the ball's long gone, at least until the hands are back at three o'clock on the other side. So if you're here, I'll let your foot come up. But before this, there's no real reason for it. If you do, if your right heel is coming up in the air, it's because you're moving it, and you shouldn't be moving like that from the right side at all at this point in the swing, or you're turning too much, and that's either caused because your shoulders are turning a lot, or because you're pushing off this right leg too much. But if you're moving correctly from the left side, moving as hard as I can, that's as far as I can open my hips moving from the left side of my body, my right heel is still on the ground. All right, what else do we got? Is the feel of the transition like John Wayne riding a horse? God, I wish I knew what that meant, because that is pretty cool, but I have no idea what John Wayne riding a horse feels like. Um, but if you redefine that question, I'm going to take a stab at it, because I like the analogy. Uh, okay. I'll go back over to the Q&A section. Could you explain how the down cock figures into the transition? It's natural. If you go to the top of your swing and you're getting ready to transition back to the left, what should your wrist be doing at that stage in the swing? So to clarify, I'm at the top of my swing. What should my wrist be doing here? Nothing. They should be responding to the mass of the club head swinging, which is being swung by the rotation of my body. As my body creates this initial momentum for the club, my arm is just kind of following along. The club's going to feel heavy if I don't let my wrist set at all. So my wrists are responding to the weight of the club. And now as the club begins to move this way, guess what that's going to do to my wrists? If my wrists are soft, it's going to set them. So if my wrists are up here, the club now feels heavy. So as I go back, and now I start to transition the other way, the falling mass of the club head and my wrists being soft and being drug back the other way by my rotating hips will make the club down clock. And that's how you create a down clock. There's nothing active about it. It's the last thing on earth you'd ever want to do is try and set your wrist in the down clock. Down clock is a total natural thing, but sometimes for people who have really, really bad habits of throwing the club or the wrists are too tight, I'll make them do some drills exaggerating that down clock motion, but that's uh, totally passive. So, let's see if I can find some more questions in here. Uh, in the transition, my right elbow is at 45 degrees. I know it should be vertical but I can't get it there. So, Bill, uh, I think I understand your question. Let me read it one more time. At 45 degrees, I know it should be vertical. So I'm assuming you're talking about this position and your elbow is like this. So if that's what you mean, then there's 
Typically, what causes is just not enough external rotation in the arm, but it's not likely because pretty much everybody can stick their arm up like this. Well, this would be effectively a little bit tilted over, just depending on what your spine angle is. But if, if you have that much external rotation in your right elbow, it's enough. If your elbow is really bad like this, that's because you pushed your left arm really hard across your body. But if it's a little bit out like this, it's perfectly okay. Again, your arm should be really relaxed at this stage. So they're just going to start to fall back in front of your body. Shouldn't be a problem. Let's see. If I get my hand and arms too, fine, too far behind me at the top, how does that affect the transition? Um, it's going to make it suck, Rob, because your arms are going to get stuck behind your body. So what happens when you make your arms swing really deep like this because you overused your arms, what have you done? What have you told your brain? Think about that for a second. You've taken your arms and clubs and swung them really deep. There's a consequence for every move that you do in the swing. The consequence here is that you've really stretched this whole left shoulder girdle because it's being pulled deep across your body. Guess where the tension in your body is now? This is maxed out. You can't move it any further than this. So your brain is saying, hey, I guess he wants to use this first to start the downswing. Same thing with your right arm. Some people do it like this. It's loading up this right pec to get it into a position where it really can push and be powerful. If you swing your arms too deep, you're overusing your arms and nothing will sequence correctly unless you put together a really clever set of compensations in order to put it all back together. So the key is keeping your arms out of the swing in that part of the swing. During the back swing, they don't have to really do much. Just let them chill out and focus on using your body to turn them back, and then your arms can chill out and stay in front of your body. It makes the golf swing a million times easier. All right. How do I move my hips forward without spinning or sliding them? Move from the left side of the body. That's covered in the videos. So anytime we're talking about transition, transition videos, down swing videos, weight shift videos, all that stuff that's covered on the site. If you're spinning or sliding, it's only going to come from one place, and that is pushing from this right leg. As soon as you take that out, you can't spin, you can't slide. You move from the left side of your body. The left side of your body, if you pull from your left adductor as hard as you can, it can only pull you in a neutral joint alignment. That's the beauty of it. When you move from the correct side of your body, everything falls into place for you. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to go back through some of these other ones because... You guys are crushing me here. Uh, you dismissed closed hips downswing, but if your hips start too early at turn, would that not result in over the top? It wouldn't necessarily result in the over, over the top, but it can. That's pretty common, especially for amateur golfers. But uh, if you start too early, would that result in over the top? The key, again, is where you move from. If you move from the left side of your body, assuming you're rocking the golfer playing from the left side of the ball, with right-handed golf clubs. If you move from this side, I'm going to turn as hard as I can. Well, my hips can only get 45 degrees open. I can't get any more open than this. So it's impossible for me to come over the top unless I do something with my arms. But assuming my arms are chilled out and nice and relaxed at the top, and I move just from the left side, it's not possible for you to come over the top. The only way you're going to come over the top is, again, pushing from the right side, heaving from the right side of your body. Uh, in, Dwight, inside muscles of your thighs here. So think of the, the really odd exercise at the gym where you squeeze your legs together. And I like to help people feel this at the golf course when we're doing lessons. They have them take their left foot, stick it on the ground, put all your weight on your right side, and drag your left foot over, and you'll feel these muscles activate. And those are the similar, those are the same muscles that you use to help pull you over to the left side. Uh, let's see. Uh, how do I move my hips forward without spinning or sliding them? I think I answered that one. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, my transition is too quick and I'm hitting from the top. How to slow down the transition? Uh, all right, so I'll take that one on again. Tension, tension, tension. Where the tension is, is going to dictate where you sequence and how you sequence your downswing. But some of you guys really like training age and you've seen this floppy golf club I have here. Um, I'm not a big fan of training aids. As you guys probably know, I'm a fan of teaching you how to do everything correctly with your body, but some training aids have some value in life. And I used to really use a lot the I think called the Whippy Tempo Master. I'm sure you guys have seen it. 
But it was basically like this, but had an insanely whippy shaft. And it was so whippy that it was kind of not really useful in the real world applique. Because you had to swing so slow and so smooth with your tempo that it just not, it didn't replicate what a real swing was like. And so recently, somebody from the UK sent me these and they're called G Force. Uh, and I'm going to, we have a link to them on the website. We just put it up today for you guys. Uh, so I'll put a link up on the, uh, the webinar here in a second. But basically what it is, it's like a whippy tempo master on steroids. So it's a much thicker shaft, and so it's not so whippy. You can bend the whippy tempo master in half, basically. So in order to help you be smooth, if you like training aids, rather than just focusing on keeping your body soft, these are really cool because if you get a little quick, especially during the transition, so I know for the takeaway, excuse me, some of you guys asked about how to stop rolling your wrists. This exaggerates all those movements, so it helps you feel them a lot easier. So as you go to the top and you start swinging really hard from the top, you can see this thing's really going to get my attention here. So if I go to the top and swing nice and smooth and keep my stuff sequenced correctly instead of trying to tension with my hands, my hands are nice and relaxed, as long as I let everything go nice and soft, I'll feel the club set and bend and stress the shaft. And then I'm going to maintain that all the way down to impact, and I'll help feel that lag. So I'll put that up there real quick so you guys, you big training aid nuts out there, uh, you'll be able to get access to that on the site. So let's see if this shows up. Uh, I think we, we might have put this on sale for you guys who are attending the clinic. So, all right, so it's on sale for an hour, I believe. So, you should see that there. So if you like that kind of stuff and you like it, uh, a real training, you can actually hit balls with this, which is pretty cool. But it really will force you to smooth out your transition. Now, at the end of the day, training aids are not the answer. The answer is using your body correctly. As soon as you let go of that training aid, what are you going to do? But that doesn't mean you can't use a training aid like this along with using your body correctly as you're, as you're working them together to help accelerate the learning process. Because this will... Instantly, as soon as you start throwing it, it's going to feel terrible because the shaft bends in the other direction. So, anyway, hopefully that uh, helps. How is this device different from the Orange Whip? Uh, it's way freaking cheaper. No offense to the Orange Whip, guys. The Orange Whip's great, but it's just too damn expensive for something you can't hit a golf ball with. And I've had numerous discussions with them. They've had numerous people tell them the same thing, but they sell a ton of them. So, you know, uh, they're in business to make money. I get it. I think they could sell a lot more if they were cheaper. This is like 40 bucks cheaper, and you can hit balls with it. So uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. And really cool about this, this is a wedge, but they actually have a wedge and a 7-iron. So I really, in my chipping stuff, I am a big proponent of using your body, especially your lower body, in chip shots. And so that allows you to keep your hands in reserve and keep them really soft in order to manipulate the, the club face a little bit. So if you want to put a little hook spin on one to get it to roll up a second tier, you want to hold it off a little bit. Keeping your hands really soft gives you a great touch around the green. So that's what I've been using this a lot for, is hitting little chip shots with it because then it helps smooth out my, my pitching. So they made a, a seven iron and a, and a pitching wedge, which is a 54 degree. So it's really cool for that. So the big difference between that and the orange whip, you can hit balls with it. And it's way cheaper. So uh, let's see. Let's see if I can get back to where I was. Can you discuss driver transition versus iron? Where's your weight? It's the same. The golf swing is all about movement patterns. So whether you're hitting a wedge, a seven iron, a two iron, a driver, it's all exactly the same. The only difference is the timing of it is a little bit different because you've got, and of course, the swing playing posture. But the sequence that you're moving your body, your weight shift, etc., all of that stuff is exactly the same. It never changes. You don't want to try and learn 13 different golf swings. You want to learn one golf swing, which is all about moving your body correctly, and that will get everything following the sequence for you. So they're, they're the same. How do I get rid of the gremlin that jumps on my shoulders at the top of my swing and tells me to hurry? Phil, you can hurry if you use your lower body. If you want to smash the ball, trust me, I love smashing the ball. It's all about moving your trunk first. This is the biggest bone structure in your body, your pelvis. So if you move this fast, it's pretty hard to do. So you've got to be a little bit patient because you've got to give this time to shift back over. It can't move nearly as fast as your wrists and hands and stuff can. So 
if you're going to move fast, you move the ball hard. I'm all for it. I love crushing it. It's all about getting this to move fast, and then don't worry about this. Let this follow along, and then everything will start to fall into place. Uh, how important is keeping the weight on the ankles throughout the swing, and would it make easier for transition focus, focusing on the left ankle uh, when to shift the weight to start? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first of all, let me be clear about something. And I, for those of you, I think a lot. This is all just you know. None of you guys are, are prime, premium members, so. There's a lot of stuff that's covered on the site. There's 300 and something videos, maybe four or 500 videos on there now. So there's a lot of stuff that's all covered on there. So I won't go super in depth on this, but the weight moves in a circle eight pattern in the swing. It doesn't just move laterally from your ankle to your ankle. As you go at a dress, when I go back, your weight's actually gonna move further back and it's gonna move a little bit on the ball of your foot at the top of your swing. Now, the weight's gonna move back to my ankle and it's going to move on to the ball of my right foot. So it moves in this figure eight pattern. But if you wanted to think about, I like to use something that I'll, I'll, oftentimes I'll stick a T or something under my student's foot and let them lift their left heel at the top of the backswing a little bit and then tell them to smash it down in. And that helps them focus on getting the lower body and the left side awake to help move their weight back to the left. So that's a good way to think about it if you think about kind of using the left side. Uh, let's see. Um, try to catch up here. Hey, looking for some tips. Got a sales pitch. Sorry, Dave. What did I, uh, where did I miss you? I'm pretty much the anti-sales guy. So if I can help you, I definitely will. All right. Any, let me see any other questions. Trying to catch up with them here, but I got a little overwhelmed there for a second. Um, no other questions in the Q&A section? Can you practice the transition weight shift in slow motion, or does it have to be done at real speed? That's a great question. Um, Gary, it needs to be both. This is a huge mistake that so many students make. You have to start slow at first, or you'll just never get it. You'll keep repeating the same movement patterns because your brain is really lazy. And it likes to do the stuff that you're already really good at over and over and over again. So if you are struggling with this stuff and you can't get the transition correctly, the obvious answer, which should be obvious, but we don't always realize it this way, is that you should just slow down. How slow should you go? Slow enough that you can do the movement exactly right. And that's the speed that your brain can keep up right now. So if that's really, really seriously slow, that's just the speed you need to go right now. But that doesn't mean you stay at that speed forever. In fact, what you've got to do is begin to challenge your brain. Once you can do the movement correctly at a certain speed, slowly start ramping up that speed until you can do it at real speed. And the same thing with the club. Everything in RST is all about stacking and sequencing. So if you're working on your transition, guess what I'm going to make you do? Take your arms out of it. You don't need them right now. You're never going to learn a proper transition if you're worried about swinging your arms, the position of your wrists at the top, the angle of the club face, if you're, how much lag you're going to create, it'll never work. Nobody's brain can keep up with all that crap. So I'm going to take your arms out of it, and then I'm going to have you focus on just, never put your head back in your ass, and focus on your lower body. And if this is the speed that you can go, that's the speed we work at. And I see you the next time, or you're at home doing these drills on your own, then you're going to try to speed it up a little bit and speed it up a little bit, and so on. And once I can do it with speed, I stack another piece on there to challenge my brain, which might be speed, I might keep ramping it up, or I might put one arm out there. Now I'm gonna focus on the same thing. When you look at the RST five-step stuff, that's exactly the sequence that we go through. Take your arms out of it, focus on your lower body. Once your lower body's working correctly, then we're gonna add another piece. We're gonna add that left arm, we'll add the club, so on and so forth. So, First of all, go as slow as you need to to get the movement right. Add challenge to it by adding speed, stacking complex pieces on it, and as you keep going, that's how you learn. The reality is, the problem is people want to take something that they learn as a quick tip, quick fix, and go straight to the driving range and start smashing drivers. Some people do. I've given lessons where people have gone out and shot their best life in the round right after the lesson. And I've had times when people don't. It's just the normal of it. But you need to think about it with some logic for a second. 
If you learn how to drive a car on a manual transmission, which many of us old timers did, I know I'm 40 now, so I consider myself an old timer. I learned how to drive on a manual transmission. In doing that, I learned in a parking lot with no people around, nothing to hit, et cetera, right? And I'm sure you probably did some backcountry road, nobody around because there were no distractions. You didn't do that at a racetrack, nor did you learn how to drive in the parking lot and then instantly the next day go try and do drive the Indy 500. You would have killed yourself and everybody around you. The golf swing is no different. Learning is learning. So when you're working at home and you're doing your drills in front of your mirror, like, oh, Chuck's having me focus on moving his knee and get posted up and get this great impact position. Okay, let's go play tomorrow and I'm going to swing as hard as I can. How realistic is that? Nothing in your life have you ever learned like that. Nothing, at least not productively. So if you actually want to learn this point, which I'm assuming you do, then you've got to take the steps that are required to learn. Everybody has to go through the same stuff. The, the trick is, if you go a little bit slower at the beginning and get the fundamentals down, and really, the RC five-step stuff is five steps. If you go through those five steps, you're going to be in the ball the best you ever have, I guarantee it. But if you go really fast and you skip the boring stuff up front, which is weight shift and transition and using your core and body rotation, and you go right into wailing on the club and down cocking and hitting the driver, it's going to take you 10 times longer than it would if you just took a little bit of extra time and slowed down the beginning to learn the fundamentals and get your body moving correctly. All right, let me pick up some more questions here. What three videos would you recommend on the site at this webinar on the topic of transition? The five-step series, the RC five-step stuff, is really the stuff that's going to make this the quickest way to learn it. Everybody wants to learn stuff fast. Now, I've got a lot of videos on weight shift and transition, so if you just Google or search on the website for transition, it'll pop up. But I really recommend for the average guy who's really wanting to improve and get as good as they can, as quickly as they can, they go through the five-step stuff because it doesn't bog you down in all the details. There's tons of stuff that you can you know, spend the rest of your life, and most, many people do, you know, chasing, you know, getting the club just perfect here and just perfect there, and it doesn't really make that big of a difference. You know, if you're trying to just go out and play really good golf and become a really good ball striker, focus on just the core of the five-step stuff. Get set up correctly, rotate correctly, use your body correctly, learn how to use the lead side, learn how to take this right arm out of the picture in the sequence that I stack it on, in that five-step video, five-step series, and that's really the core of it. And then once you do that, you'll be so happy with your swing. You don't want to go back and look at other details. I want to correct this, or I want to predispose myself to a draw or a fade or whatever it may be. But the five-step stuff is really the, I mean, that's honestly, it's 21 years of work of me teaching. I gave my first lesson when I was 19. So 21 years of trying to figure out how to make people improve as fast as humanly possible. And in doing that, still giving them the real core, the guts of what's really, you know, I'm, I'm not a tips teacher. I hate golf tips. I'm all about teaching you fundamentals based on science and fact. And that is what that five step stuff is boiled. Everything I've done playing competitive golf for 26 years is what that's all about. So I can't make it any simpler than that really. So that would be my, my video recommendation for you guys. Uh, your clinics are always in Orlando. You go elsewhere ever. I did one in California last year. Um, I'm pretty much going to do them just in Florida this year for a bunch of different reasons. So I pretty much am just doing them here. A lot of it has to do with the dreaded tax man and everybody wanting to pay state income tax me to do a clinic somewhere else. So a whole other set of issues there. But um, while we're in the process of learning five step, could we, and we go play around, it could be confusing because we haven't really five step yet and old habits will kick in the course advice. Yes, Jalil, it's a great question. So. Here is the key with this stuff. I want you to go out and play. Golf is all about having fun. It's not about just doing tons and tons and tons of work and drills. That's part of it. It's what's necessary for you to learn something that's very complex and very intricate and requires a tremendous amount of precision, which is what golf does. You have to be able to get the golf ball square on the club face with a square path. and There's just so many variables that go into it. So if you're going to go out and play while you're practicing, here's what I recommend. Focus on one or two things and come hell or high water, you focus on that for all 18 holes. No matter what happens, you accept the consequences that if you're going to go out and play while you're trying to work on something in transition, 
that you may hit some goofy shots that you've never hit before. You'll also hit some great shots that you've never hit before, but it'll be up and down depending on the number of reps you've got in and where your brain's at and what your focus level and commitment is to what it is you're working on. But nobody, you know, Tiger Woods, as he's proven very well, can focus on swing stuff and go out and play great golf. It's just too difficult. Your brain has so many things it's trying to juggle. So if you're going to go out and play, pick up a sleeve of the pinnacles and go out and just don't worry about what the ball's going. And most importantly, don't use the ball flight as your judge of whether or not you did the movement correctly. Because there's a million things that alter ball flight. And honestly, fixing ball flight is the easiest thing in the world that any competent instructor can go and manipulate one way or another and change ball flight, right? So if you're trying to really fix fundamentals, what you judge your success on is not what the ball did, but did you do the movement correctly? Well, how do I know if I did the movement correctly? By now, if you're gonna go out and try and take something you're doing inside in front of a mirror and do it on the course, you better know what it feels like when you do it correctly, or you've got no business being out there trying to do it, right? You can't feel what's doing, what you're doing on the course, you're, you can't see it. So you have to do enough reps to realize, okay, I'm going to work on just this one move and make it really simple when you're going out to play. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to try and do my little squat transition. And so I'll do, before every shot that I hit, I'll do a couple little drills to feel that before each ball and then go and hit it. And if I hit a bad shot, it's okay. My marker of success is whether or not I feel like I did the movement correctly. And of course, nowadays, you can just stick your camera out there in the video and see if you did it right or not. So... Uh, let's see, what is the main cause for the right shoulder dropping and causing the pull shot, pushing from the right leg? Uh, let's see, I'm hitting over 30 yards further, thank you. That was quick, Dave, it only took us 50 minutes, that's great. Uh, I've developed a pull with the irons, especially when I pull the club into the ball with the left arm. If you're pulling it, there's a couple things that are going on. Let's just assume some certain things here. Let's assume that you're transitioning correctly, right? I, I have to make an assumption, you may not be, and that could be causing the shock that's going on, but if you're pulling it with the club, I would look at, there's so many things would go wrong here. You could be over-rotating wrist by trying to actively do it, and since you mentioned pulling with your left arm, that's probably where I would go with it. That pulling motion is really subtle. It's not like you're trying to rip your arm down. The arm is getting pulled down by your transition. But the, the point is, this left arm has to be guiding the club into impact, but it's not a very active pull. It should be pretty relaxed, relatively, because the majority of the work is being done by your trunk. Okay, So as you start down, your left arm is really just kind of guiding the club. Don't think about ripping it down, because if you create a lot of tension there, you may start over-releasing the club and do a bunch of other goofy things. So that would be my guess there. All right, so I'm as there's 200 people here trying to ask questions. So I'm doing my best to get to all of them, but I'm definitely gonna miss a bunch. Uh, okay. Uh, Does the shoulder glide bring along and activate the rest of the torso and the legs in the backswing? Shoulder glide bring along and activate the rest of the torso. Ah, uh, good question. Rob, so Rob's question, let me read it out loud because you guys can't see it there. Does the shoulder glide bring along and activate the rest of the torso and the legs in the backswing? Yes and no. The first thing is, in the real world, where I'm talking about pulling this right shoulder blade back, it's helping initiate a centered rotation. But it's not the only thing that's moving. Really, you're moving from your core and your obliques and your trunk. And that includes moving from your lower body a little bit during the beginning. It's not just the shoulder blade glide. I'm trying to focus on that to make it really, really simple and to make sure that people learn how to pull instead of push during the backswing because of all the problems that creates. So if you focus on that while also feeling like you're using your legs to help you turn a little bit, it'll help you activate them early so it's easier to get them activated in the downswing. So hopefully that answers that question in a simple, quick. How does posting up alter spine angle? Uh, good question. Um, it happens in 3D space. It's hard to describe in like one angle here, so I'll do my best to quickly explain it. I think it's more of an impact thing, so I'm going to go through it quickly because, again, I'm going to try to keep this stuff transition-oriented. But as you're posting up and your chest is staying down, my spine is actually going to have some curvature in it, so when you look at it from this side, it's actually got what we call side bend. And that's how I keep 
So here's a great way of thinking about it. I had an old coach many, many years ago when I was still playing concussion that gave me this analogy, so I'm going to borrow it from him. He told me to feel like I had a string tied to my shirt here on the ground, and that string could never change. Obviously, it couldn't go up this way, and I didn't want to go down, so I want to keep the string taut the whole time. Now, it's over-exaggeration. It's not realistic, but it'll help you feel, especially during this transition phase, instead of popping up like this where the string would break or going down way too far, if you imagine keeping that string at constant tension, it's kind of a good, simple way of thinking about as long as you move your body correctly, it'll help your spine move through the right sequence of movements without having to get too complicated with it. Does the body rotation slow or stop at any point to allow the pelvic release, or are you rotating at a constant speed? It's as slow to the point of almost stopping. That's how you release it. Your body must post up, and this posting up motion decelerates the hips, which allows all the energy to transfer up the chain. So absolutely, your hips have got to almost come to a stop or come to a stop. And if you look at some golfers, even look at Roy McIlroy as an example, his hips actually go backwards as he's releasing the club. So yes, absolutely. The last thing on earth you want to do is just keep turning your hips through the hitting area. You've got to post up. Okay. Does the navel move at the start of the back swing? Yeah, it does. Uh, what can I do to prevent fading the ball during transition? There's like 50,000 things that can cause a fade, so I'm gonna, that would be a lot of difficult stuff there. Uh, Jack, have any questions sent earlier before you start? Yes, I did have uh, a lot of questions and posts in there, so I didn't know this is our first one here, so I appreciate you guys hanging in here with me, but uh, I would love to get your feedback on this, so please feel free to you know, post them in here, and I'll definitely try to go back and read them. I do want to give you guys one more offer. Uh, let's see if I can get rid of this one here real quick. So thanks for hanging in there with me. I want to give you one special deal that we have uh, just for hanging in here for me and be pa being patient. That if you guys are interested in joining the site and trying it out, learning a little bit more about RST, there's an offer on it now that you should see on your screen for a buck. If you can't swing a buck to try rotary swing out, I don't know what to tell you. If you don't like it, I'll give you your whole dollar back, I promise. But for three days, go and watch all the videos this weekend. Go and gorge on Rotary Spin for the next three days and see what you like. You'll see that everything that we do is based on a tremendous amount of work that I've put into studying the swing, that my team has put into studying the swing and understanding the biomechanics and physics and anatomy of it. And for a dollar, it's pretty much tough to beat. So please feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, it's a limited deal. Thank you. There's about 100 offers on there, and or 25, only 25 of them, and they're available for the next hour. So, anyway, hopefully that, uh, hopefully you guys found this productive. And like I said, if you have any other comments or things, please post them in here. I'll leave this open for a little bit so I can keep gathering all your questions and questions in the chat stuff, and I'll go back through and read them. So I've got homework tonight. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, if you guys have any last questions, I'll try and give them to them really quick. We've got a few minutes left before. We gotta close down here. Robert, you're welcome. Uh, anything else? Nothing else? You're welcome, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. Uh, do you subscribe to the two cheeks theory? No. Simple answer. Uh, if you're gonna get your hips that open, you're gonna be pushing them right off the right side. What about training over the winter? There's a whole winter series on the site. It's literally called the Winter Golf Training Program. So. That would be or a good dollar investment for you, Brian. Focus on doing the stuff that's in there. You can do all of the stuff on the site. All of the RST five step, all of the videos, all the winter golf training stuff is meant to be indoors. You don't have to be hitting balls. In fact, I don't want you hitting balls most of the time until you get enough reps in there. So please understand that. That is really the core essence of what rotor spin is about, is teaching you how to move your body correctly, which will in result move the club correctly. So, uh, anything else? You're welcome, guys. Thanks for reaching out. Appreciate it. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Are you posting this anywhere for review? Uh, yes, there should be a link sent out afterwards um, that will allow you to watch this webinar again. If not, uh, I will have a copy of it and I'll email it out to you guys next week. So if you missed anything, and I know I missed a bunch of stuff, so I will do my best to try and get back to some of these questions. But 
So yeah, you guys are welcome. Appreciate it. Thanks for saying thank you. Anything else out there? Tell them about the swing analysis. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dennis. Yeah. Um, the swing analysis, you know, uh, you can purchase them individually. They're nine bucks each. The cheapest golf lesson you're ever going to get, I promise. And these guys are all certified, trained uh, RST pros. You don't have to be a premium member anywhere anymore now. So you can just, as a free member of the site, you can go and buy a swing review for nine bucks and you get somebody to review your swing as a certified RST instructor for nine bucks. It's a no brainer. Uh, yeah, uh, Jalil, yes, I'm going to try and post this later for you guys to review. We'll club up or come back on screen. Uh, you should see a tab on the right hand side of your webinar screen that says offers, I believe. Um, can you guys see the, all the offers? Let me see if they're both on there. No? Okay, so uh, for those of you, the the link to the, if you go to the store, so go to the website, go to rotorysling.com, and on the top, click golf training aids, and in there you'll see the, uh, once you go to golf training aids, you'll see the GeForce wedge in there, and you'll be able to order it at that price uh, for, for the next hour, so. Is there anything you teach us that conflicts with Ben Hogan? A lot, probably. <laughs> uh, that's a whole other video series. We'll, we'll do that one later. Uh, Tom, you're welcome. You're Oscar, you're welcome. Let's see. All right, guys. So I'll leave this running up here for a little bit more so if you can get the offers that are on here if you want. And uh, if you guys hopefully can leave any other feedback for us and we'll talk to you guys again soon. Thanks so much.